let's let's start with the US national security strategy which divides the world in democracies and autocracies when we look at this rhetoric during the last 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union we see that this rhetoric has been the same war after wars coups after coups every time there is a new Hitler that must be defeated and how I want to know how do you how do you see the behavior of the US foreign policy during the last 30 years specifically uh, we are talking about the, the uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union yes okay that's an easy one to answer uh, it was the Soviet collapse the collapse of the government and the breakup of the Soviet Union and its uh, Eastern European uh, satellites that <clears throat> gave the American neoconservatives the idea that the U.S. could exercise hegemony over the world because the previous constraint on American unilateralism was the Soviet Union and suddenly it's gone. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a surprise to Washington. It wasn't expected and it was nothing that Reagan uh, intended. I know for a fact and I also know uh, none of us expected a Soviet collapse. Uh, but um, and the, and the collapse often is attributed to the U.S., but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the Soviet uh, government collapsed because the hardline members of the Politburo thought Gorbachev was um, uh, giving in too much too quick and was uh, threatening uh, the Soviet position in the world and placed him under house arrest. And that began the unraveling, you know, that led to Yeltsin and the breakup of the Soviet Union. This was not an American responsibility. But faced with, with that occurrence, the neoconservatives quickly created a new foreign policy doctrine. And this doctrine said that henceforth the principal purpose of American foreign policy was to prevent the rise of any power that could act as a constraint on American unilateralism. This is known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine, and it was a declaration of U.S. hegemony in the world. So uh, this then explains uh, why the United States uh, could uh, orchestrate situations in the Middle East. Uh, basically, the neoconservatives were dedicated to clearing away opponents of Israel, primarily the countries that were supplying Hezbollah, the militia in Lebanon, with financial aid and weapons. The Israelis had twice tried to occupy southern Lebanon. They want the water resources there. There's a river there. And they were twice driven out by the Hezbollah militia. And this was a huge embarrassment for the Israeli army to be defeated and driven out by militia. So they didn't want to risk a third time. And so the neoconservatives, who were closely allied with Israel, every bit as close as they are with, with Washington, uh, concocted uh, the whole 9-11 scenario, the weapons of mass destruction, and all of the rest. And the intention was to eliminate um, Iraq, um, 
of Syria, Iran, and clear away those who were uh, supplying Hezbollah. So this was not possible when the Soviet Union was there because uh, Iraq and the Syria were uh, allied with, uh, with the Soviets. So that began it. So um, until um, Putin uh, spoke at the Munich Security Conference, I think it was 2007, uh, Washington had dismissed Russia as any kind of uh, uh, constraint. And Washington was not concerned with China because they were uh, advised by economists who clearly didn't know what they were talking about. There would be 50 years before China uh, could challenge the U.S. Uh, this, of course, was mistaken because uh, Wall Street was driving all of American manufacturing out of the United States into China. And so China very quickly had all the technology, all the business know-how, and so on. Uh, but this was not recognized. Uh, and and uh, Russia was dismissed as a constraint until Putin spoke at the Munich Security Conference, which I said, I think was 2007. And he rejected the notion of a unipolar world. Well, for the previous six years, the U.S. had been involved in wars in the Middle East and had not been paying in any close attention to what was happening in Russia. And, and all of a sudden, they found they had neglected the one power that could rise up and serve as a constraint. And so they began planning, what will they do about Russia and Putin? And they first tried Georgia. Uh, the, uh, the Americans trained and equipped the Georgian army and sick them on South Ossetia. And all this while Putin was inattentive at the Beijing Olympics, <laughs> paying no attention. And um, they thought that this would uh, cause a lot of turmoil and trouble and and humiliation for Russia, or at least give them uh, campaign propaganda against uh, the Russians for invading Georgia. Well, uh, the Russian army actually was involved there, and in a few days the whole thing was over. And so all the United States got out of it was the propaganda, oh, the Russians are trying to put their empire back together, they invaded Georgia. Um, uh, but, of course, they left. They didn't keep Georgia. <laughs> but, but Washington propaganda didn't, uh, didn't point that out. So then they began uh, the conspiracy in Ukraine. Um, Victoria Newland uh, later bragged uh, openly in a public uh, audience that the U.S. had invested $5 billion dollars uh, in subversion in Ukraine, organizing protest groups, buying politicians, and set the situation up for the so-called maiden revolution. This was an American coup. And again, where was Putin? Uh, he was at the Sochi Olympics, paying no attention. <laughs> uh, so... Um, uh, the fact that the Kremlin was so inattentive uh, worked very well for uh, Washington and uh, a government that was uh, on good terms with the East and West, and particularly with Russia, uh, was overthrown and replaced with essentially some kind of neo-Nazi operation. Well, um, the first thing that happened after we have this new Ukrainian government. This is pre-Zelensky. I forget the name of the person Washington installed as the president of Ukraine. It was a Ukrainians began harassing 
the Donbass Russians. Uh, well, uh, Donbass had been uh, formally part of the Russia, of Russia, not of Ukraine. It was transferred in uh, to Ukraine for whatever the reasons by Soviet officials. Uh, the same with Crimea. Crimea was transferred into Ukraine by Khrushchev. Uh, it didn't matter to Khrushchev uh, because it was all the same country. <laughs> uh, so the Russians were confronted with the loss of their Black Sea naval base. Well, uh, the people in uh, Crimea are Russian. They're not Ukrainian. And they quickly voted to be reabsorbed by Russia, which they've been a part of uh, for three centuries. So the Donbass Russians did the same, but the Kremlin said no to them. This was a strategic mistake of the first order. And all the subsequent problems have come from that. But they took Crimea back. And of course now this played into Washington's hands for all the propaganda and demonizing uh, Russia again. And of course Ukraine had been an independent country only for 30 years or less. <laughs> Ukraine itself had been part of Russia for centuries. So um, the refusal of the Kremlin to take Donbass, because they gave the same vote, uh, meant that for eight years the Russians in the Donbass area were uh, slaughtered, bombed, shelled, uh, and the Donbass area became increasingly under Ukrainian occupation and the, the part that was still held by the two self-declared and independent republics shrank. And all this time, the Kremlin had some fantasy of a Minsk agreement. And they were spent eight years, they wasted eight years trying to, um, to get compliance with the Minsk agreement, uh, even though it was obvious no one was going to comply. And we later learned both from the former German chancellor and the former French president, it was all a trick to fool Putin so that he wouldn't do anything while U.S. and NATO built up a huge Ukrainian army. And so what finally forced the Russian intervention in Donbass was the presence of a very large Ukrainian army that was about to overrun the two independent republics that Putin had refused to take back into Russia. Well, faced with this, uh, very quickly uh, the Russian government uh, recognized the independent republics. So once they recognized them, then the independent republics could ask for help. And so the Russians moved in. But curiously, they moved in in a very limited and essentially ineffectual way, which surprised everyone. And it's so ineffectual, we're now, what, into the 15th, 14th, 15th month of certainly a major military power. stalemated with some third world country. <laughs> and this is hugely adversely impacted uh, the reputation of Russia, the government, and its military capability. And consequently, the provocations from the West of Russia have increased and increased and increased. And we see it in many ways. First, the sanctions, then the seizure of the Russian central banks, reserves. These are illegal actions. Uh, then we, we see um, 
the aid to Ukraine, you know, financial aid, and then light weapons aid, and oh, we'll never send heavy weapons, and then uh, we start sending heavy weapons, and then uh, we, we, we'll never send tanks, and then we send tanks, and we'll never send long-range missiles, now we send long-range missiles. We'll never send jet fighters, and it looks like now we'll send jet fighters. Uh, we have NATO personnel, U.S. personnel there, uh, training, uh, operating the new equipment because the Ukrainians don't know how and haven't had time to be trained. Where we have the Americans providing military intelligence, targeting information, um, and so the conflict, which Putin wanted to be limited, keeps widening. It gets wider, and it's in many ways. For example, we now have Finland is now a NATO member. <laughs> so there's even closer uh, NATO forces uh, on Russia's border. Uh, Sweden apparently is going to take this process. So by refusing to act decisively and end the conflict quickly, the Kremlin has allowed the West to essentially take control of the war and expand it and expand it and expand it. And the West is now confident that when the Kremlin declares a red line, it means nothing, absolutely nothing, because none have ever been enforced. And so this means the West will get more reckless. <laughs> And uh, so this is the sort of situation. It plays into the hands of the neoconservatives view. We can reestablish American primacy, American hegemony. And uh, what is convincing them is the lack of any Russian action to end the conflict, other than through negotiation. Now, when the Americans look at this, they say, well, look, how many times has Lavrov and Putin said that uh, every time they negotiate with the West, they get deceived that they'll never trust them again, and yet they want to have another negotiation. <laughs> so the, what I'm illustrating, I think, or I hope I'm illustrating, is that uh, the West is now confident well, the neoconservatives are. I think most of the people have no idea what's going on. But the neoconservatives who control and define the American foreign policy are now confident that they can reestablish the hegemony that the U.S. had. And um, they're so confident that they're carrying the same kinds of provocations to China. It, it's beginning with Taiwan. Uh, the U.S. is, in effect, uh, disavowing the one China policy that dates, I think, from 1973 or 1974 during, during President Nixon's term when the United States acknowledged one China. Uh, we uh, supported removing Taiwan from the Security Council of the U.N. and putting China in its place. Well, now it looks like you know, we're trying to backpedal as part of a provocation of China. So why would the United States want to cause warlock situation with two powerful countries that are nuclear armed? And it, the only explanation is uh, the neoconservative insistence on the American hegemony. And you, 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 you gave a comprehensive explanation on what's, what's going on in, between Russia and China and United States. But Putin came a long way to finally decide to confront NATO, to confront the U.S. in Ukraine. He wanted, he wanted to join NATO. He wanted to bring his conflict down, but 
why was the U.S. not willing to let them in, to let to let the animosity go away? Why was that? Well, I just told you, uh, you uh, the Washington is run by the neoconservatives. They dominate the National Security Council, the State Department, the Pentagon, and their agenda is American hegemony. So uh, Putin rejected in 2007 American hegemony, and so uh, Russia is now an obstacle to hegemony. Uh, China's rose in five years instead of 50. <laughs> what the CIA had told the government, 50 years, yeah, five. So they have another obstacle, obstacle to the hegemony, and they're primarily concerned with removing these obstacles. Maybe they think if they cause enough uh, trouble and embarrassment uh, that uh, Putin will be overthrown. Maybe they think that uh, they cause enough trouble and embarrassment the uh, Chinese government will somehow be shaken up. Um, the CIA has been very effective in coups. And they've overthrown a lot of governments. And, uh, the the, the Russian government allowed uh, American and, and Western financed NGOs to operate in Russia for years. No one knows what kind of organizations they have built up, what kinds of protest groups, student groups, how many politicians they bought. No, people don't know this. It's not just that Novanton. Nivaldi person, I forget his name, how do you pronounce his name? You know what I mean, the one that uh, accused Putin of trying to poison him and so on. Uh, Nivaldi? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Uh, so, um, and another reason, I think, that the U.S. prefers Russia and China as enemies is the military security complex. Uh, the Cold War, it's the many decades of the Cold War created a powerful and massive uh, armaments industry in the United States and a powerful and unaccountable CIA. Well, they have a huge budget. The, the budget of the U.S. military security complex is at least a trillion dollars annually. That is one thousand billion dollars annually. Well, how can you justify that kind of money if you don't have dangerous enemies? So if Russia is just another part of the American operation, we block it the military security complex lost an enemy. If China goes all peaceful, we've lost another enemy. And so why do we have this massive armaments industry when we got homeless people all over the country? I mean, every city in America that has a climate that's not brutal in the winter is full of homeless people. They live in the streets. They live under the bridges. They, there's huge numbers of these people. But, you know, there's, there's all kinds of uh, uh, people who don't have health coverage. All, all this money could be used in different ways. And so, but the military security complex is powerful. And it enjoys the budgets and the profits. And so it's not going to let go Russia is an enemy and China is an enemy and for the Russians to think that somehow they can be accepted they, they're overlooking the power of the military security complex as long ago as 1961 President Dwight Eisenhower
There's a jet going over. <laughs> I live between two air bases, and they make a lot of noise. Um, in 1961, President Dwight Eisenhower, in his last public address to the American people, warned of the military security complex. He said the military security complex had grown so powerful that it was a danger to American democracy. And that, you know, we needed to keep our eye on this and be sure that we didn't uh, uh, somehow lose uh, our essence to this powerful machine that was building up uh, as a consequence of the post-World War II Cold War. Um, well, 1961 was a long time ago. So just to, if it was already powerful then that the president, who was a five-star general, feels he has to warn us, imagine how powerful it is now. It's been another, how many, 40, another 60 years or more. So this uh, is the situation. This is the situation that's, that's real. And uh, the Kremlin seems not to take it into account in, in its hopes and, and aspirations. And uh, I think uh, it's been a terrible uh, miscalculation for the Kremlin to let the conflict in Ukraine drag on like this. It's not just because it makes the neoconservatives very confident, but it also sort of makes Europe lose its inclination that Russia would be a dangerous enemy to have when Russia can't even defeat Ukraine. And you see, one of the reasons that we're told that uh, Russia went in to uh, Donbass was to also prevent Ukraine joining NATO. But instead, we have Finland joining NATO and Sweden, apparently. So it's a loss loss for the Kremlin. What's the gain? We don't, we don't see the gain. And after 14 months or 15, whatever it's been, uh, the Ukrainians are still shelling Donbass. So it makes uh, the Kremlin look ineffectual. And this is the last thing. They need to look when the neoconservatives who control the United States government and its foreign policy are determined to uh, exercise hegemony over Russia. And um, so this is a, a situation that I think the Kremlin is equally responsible for. And what needed to be done if there's to be an intervention, it needed to be a, a, a very quick, hard, decisive strike that ended the thing in a few weeks before the West could get involved. Instead, the way the Kremlin proceeded, it gave the West forever to get involved, and they still have forever. We really don't know what's going to happen next. but. There's no sign of the Russian army. As, as far as I can tell, the Russian army is really not involved in conflict. It's being fought by the Wagner Group, which is a private military group with some relationship to the Russian army, but it's not the Russian army. And the two Donbass militias. So, you know, we hear about mobilization, so, but there's no Russian army. Where's the Russian army? How can the Kremlin let this drag on like this? It's achieving terrible results for Russia and for Europe because uh, the West gets more 
and more convinced that it can get a good result out of this. And when, when I look at the, when, when you talk about the Russia and China being the enemy of the United States, they're being the enemies of the United States, and about China, I can understand it because it's Far East, it's a pure competitor of the United States right now. But Russia, when you look at Russia, Russia is not that Soviet Union communist, and we we don't have and this security of the Europe is based on the Russian energy. In without Russian energy, Europe cannot be as as successful as it was during the last 30 years how why why I, I, I'm trying to understand the mindset of neocons what they're thinking of because nobody other than Russia can provide Europe with with cheap energy well you see uh, that is part of the neocon concern if Europe is dependent on Russian energy, then American control over Europe erodes. So uh, Europe being dependent on Russian energy uh, undermines U.S. hegemony over Europe. And so uh, this was another reason for the sanctions. It was to break up the business relationships and the energy uh, dependence with uh, between uh, Europe and Russia. And it was followed by the destruction of the Nord Sea pipelines. So Europe knows that, but they accepted it. Uh, they haven't said, oh, you mean Americans. Our energy prices have tripled. They haven't said anything. They continue supplying Ukraine. They can, uh, Europe is part of the American empire. It's not, there's no independent government in Europe. There's not a single government anywhere in Europe that's independent. Uh, they're not even independent countries. They're run by Washington. And, uh, there's nothing independent about them. So what you're having trouble understanding is you simply don't understand that the neocons intend American hegemony. And so to have Europe dependent on Russian energy is that's a no-go. And it's another goal that the neocons have achieved at Russia's expense. So it, it, I, what I find is that uh, the Russians, especially the media, they have no idea of what they confront. They think somehow it's all a mistake. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, they need to go read the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It's available. You can look it up online. <laughs> I've quoted it a hundred times in my on my website, uh, and it seems that um, Putin and Lavrov and the Russian media, they just, they, how could that be? <laughs> well, it is. It does be. <laughs> and uh, there's no way a military security complex can give up these enemies. It means the extermination of the military security complex. Why they want to self-destruct. <laughs> and the American people are accustomed to Russia as an enemy because of the decades of Cold War. There have been many decades, people. It's just normal that Russia's an enemy. And this was not Reagan's aim. It wasn't Trump's. Well, look what they did to Trump. What did Trump got into all this trouble because he said, I'm going to normalize relations with Russia. 
The minute he said that, he was doomed. Immediately, Russiagate starts. <laughs> He's a Putin agent. Uh, exactly. Then we have two fake impeachment attempts, and then we have uh, a fake insurrection. Now Pump, Trump is an insurrectionist. <laughs> he wants to overthrow the government. He's a Russian agent. Uh, then we have the documents. Stump, Trump has uh, national security documents he's taken. He's a spy. <laughs> and now we have Strippergate. Uh, all of this is because he says, I'm going to normalize relations. The same thing happened to Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was president in the early 70s. He had many agreements with the Soviets. He had SALT-1, I think SALT-2. We had the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. He had all these kinds of agreements. And then on top of that, he rubbed salt in the wound by going to China in the, and opening to China and eliminating that hostility. And then replacing uh, Taiwan with China in the Security Council. So here is Nixon getting rid of the Russian enemy, getting rid of the Chinese enemy. So what did the CIA do to him? They had Watergate. They framed him up with Watergate, a burglary. And, um, and they sent a CIA agent to the Washington Post to be a newsman. And he would write whatever the CIA handed him. And this was a managed campaign that forced Nixon's resignation. What happened to President Kennedy? He was confronted with the Cuban Missile Crisis. He worked behind the scenes with Khrushchev to calm that down. They made agreements between them. They were starting to defuse the tensions the CIA had Kennedy killed. They blamed it on some lone gunman, but no one believes it. But so it's very dangerous to be a president. Look, they got Kennedy, they got Nixon, and now they've got Trump. I, you know, is Trump going to survive this? The Republican Party, they don't want Trump either because he rocks the boat. The Republicans, they all get campaign contributions from the military security complex. Huge sums of money that they use to get reelected. Do they want to lose these sources of money? No. You know, it takes, uh, you, you have to be realistic. The trouble with the Russians now is they got all these idealistic ideas in their head. They're victims of American propaganda. They believe the propaganda, so they can't protect themselves. <laughs> and when, when we look at the China and Russia right, right now, this sort of alliance that has improved recently, we, we see they're now joining by Saudi Arabia. They're trying to to they're trying to to do the trades in their currency. How how do the neocons see these events that had that that took place recently? They they are diminishing the, the yes. power. Yeah, I get the point. But I don't I don't think they're bothered by it, and I think because what surprises everybody was how slow it was for Russia and China to get together. They're both faced with American provocations, actually American aggression. And it took forever for them to even move together. And they still don't have a mutual defense alliance. They, they've never acted intelligently about the American threat. In an intelligent reaction would have been 10 years ago or longer, they would have announced a mutual defense treaty. This would have made it difficult for the neoconservatives to continue these hostilities. We see, they still don't have one. 
And why are they, and why are they uh, going to trade in their own currencies? Well, because of American sanctions. You can't trade with Russia if you want to use dollars. <laughs> well, the Chinese need the Russian energy. I mean, what in the world was Russia intent on selling energy to its Western enemies for in the first place? It's a totally unrealistic position. Oh, let me provide my enemies with energy so they can cause me wars. <laughs> this, when the neoconservatives see the Kremlin acting like this, they say there's no intelligence there. They can't even realize we ought to get them. I mean, they look at Russia like a joke. It doesn't any, do anything. You think that they thought that, that Ukraine can defeat Russia? Well, it's 14 months. There's, there's been no advance in a long time. But I talked with, with, with See, Scott Rader recently. I talked with yeah. Scott Rader recently. He said... He said that those troops that were trained and equipped by NATO during eight years, they're all gone right now. None of them can do nothing on the battlefield right now. It's you, 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 and you said that Russia didn't use its army in this war. If yeah, Russia yeah. didn't use its army and killed all those Ukrainian trained and equipped by, by NATO, how 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 United States can think of winning in Ukraine? Well, if they kill the army, uh, but the Russian forces still haven't advanced. They haven't advanced since you know it's been months, and um, we don't know if they kill the army or not. There's very poor reporting. Now, uh, Scott Ritter. Um, just can't believe that uh, Ukraine could uh, could face Russia. None of us could believe that. But they've done it now for 14, 15 months. And, and when I say where's the Russian army, it's not committed. It's not actually in the war. As far as, you never hear anything about Russia. You hear about the Wagner Group. And all the news reporting is the Wagner Group and it's the two independent republic militias. Well, they have to be worn down because they've been fighting since uh, 2014. First trying to hold on to the Donbass and then once uh, the Wagner Group came in to Donbass, they've been fighting to advance. Now, they made initial advances long before the Re Ukrainian army was destroyed. They made initial advances. And um, then they had to pull back because they didn't have enough troops to man the frontiers they had established. And they've never really gone forward again. And, and, and now, and what we've heard for several months now is negotiation talk. Uh, the Russians keep saying, we're ready to negotiate. Uh, but it has to be, you know, our terms. Well, why are they ready to negotiate when they said over and over and over every time we negotiate we get deceived <laughs> and they want to be deceived again you have to understand when, when the neoconservatives are looking at this they're looking at a totally they see what they see is a totally ineffective opponent they can't make a single good decision it, the neoconservatives were worried that the Russian army would hit Ukraine and the whole thing would be over in a week and NATO would be scared to death and everybody would resign from NATO. The new conservatives were afraid that a real, a real attack 
would have shattered NATO because everybody would have said, my word, look at that. We don't want that kind of enemy. We don't need NATO anymore. We need peace. And, and they were worried that the NATO would simply disband because nobody would want to be in it because they didn't want to be presented as a possible enemy of Russia. Well, Putin missed, the op missed that opportunity. Just like he missed the opportunity to intervene in the Maiden Revolution. I mean, that's when the Russians should have gone in. Instead, they let the Americans take over. You can't make a succession of errors like this without convincing the neoconservatives that you're not a problem. Yeah, they'll, they'll be a, there'll be more trouble somewhere. Central Asia, the former Soviet republics in Central Asia, they're all, I'm sure the CIA's in there. I, I mean, now this can make it sound like I'm on Russia's side. No, I'm, I fear that the result of this is going to be a nuclear war and we're all going to be dead. And that's why I speak out about it. You know, I, I think that the Kremlin is helping along the nuclear war by conveying indecision, weakness, inability to act decisively. They talk decisively, but they never follow up. And so we have a situation that has encouraged more and more Western involvement and has built the confidence of the neoconservatives. It wasn't long ago that Victoria Newland, who's now, you know, promoted up, she's the Under Secretary of State. She probably runs the State Department. And she says, oh, we're going to take Crimea back. It's time to take Crimea back. Well, she wouldn't say that if she didn't believe it could be done. Well, why does she believe it can be done? I don't believe it can be done, but she believes it because they watch, they've been watching the Kremlin's reactions and they don't see an effective opponent. And so uh, we now, I think, I, I think we've had missiles now hitting inside Russia. I mean, they don't do any real damage, but it, it's great propaganda. And how, why does Putin want missiles landing in Russia? And so to the neoconservatives who are determined to have American hegemony, when they see that the main power opposing them is indecisive and incapable of acting they get confident that's and that's a danger because it at some point the Kremlin is going to be pushed into a corner where it either has to surrender or act and when it acts it will act decisively and there's when you have the war so this is what I emphasize. I'm not trying to give Putin a plan to win. <laughs> I'm trying to give Putin a plan to avoid the sort of ongoing provocations that lead to a serious war. And but, but it seems that Ukraine is so different from Russia. Scott Reader said when 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 United States went to Iraq, they brought down everything, everything. But you see that Putin didn't do anything like that. I don't know. I don't know the mindset of Putin. What what he want to do? But it must be some because between United States and Iraq there was no cultural ties, but between. Ukraine was once part of Russia. There, there are families, in, in Russian families in Ukraine and Russian, Russian yeah, families. I, I know this. I know this argument. But you know, are you going to say, oh, uh, because of cultural ties, we'll 
let the will let the path go on to nuclear war. I see. I mean, you know, nothing is worth nuclear war, and so having not intervened in 2014, having refused, if he if Putin had taken Donbas back in 2014, none of this could have happened. The, the Ukraine would not have attacked Russia herself then. And so instead, he gives them eight more years to build confidence. To, and these neo-Nazis are running everything. Um, it just gets out of control. How do you, you know, you have to stop these things early or they spiral out of control. And and they don't stop them at all. He's not doing anything to stop this. And I, does he think that somehow um, Germany and France and the U.S. who've sold him out time after time, the Minsk Agreement and everything else, that somehow they're going to come rescue him? No, they're not. You know, the only thing that can stop this is some decisive Russian military action that ends it. And then Russia establishes the government instead of America establishing the government. And then that shows the world that the Russians are serious and that they're not putting up with this. And then everybody says, well, we tried, but it was a mistake. We better not try it again. But as long as it's working for the neoconservatives, they're going to keep trying. It's simple to see that. I don't understand why Putin doesn't see it. And, you know, if I was the president I would, of the United States, I'd be concerned about the neoconservatives because ultimately it's going to end into a provocation that cannot be overlooked. And, you know, any, when you go to war, the goal is to end it as quick as you can, not to let it drag out and drag out. And the longer it drags out, the more the West is involved. The more the West is involved, the less likely they are going to let it go. You know, how, how long before they, if the Ukrainian army is worn out and dead, like Scott Rudin says, uh, then what do we get next? Polish troops, American troops? There are 20,000 American troops deployed in Romania on the border, waiting. I've seen reports of large numbers of Polish troops are deployed, waiting, because Poland wants to take part of Ukraine for itself. <laughs> so, you know, what happens then? Uh, how do you see the future purposes? of Ukraine? Yeah, how, by, by saying that, how do you see the future of Ukraine? Uh, it, Probably doesn't have one. But why do you, you know? Why does anybody think the West cares about Ukraine? It it, it only care. It's it's a it's a weapon against Russia. And the U.S. has used it successfully to break all business relationships between Europe and Russia, and to destroy the gas pipelines. So, you know, this has worked tremendously for, for the United States. It's done this, this invasion, or it's not an invasion, this intervention by Russia has done nothing for Russia. But for the U.S., it's recaptured Europe. It's not going to, you know, it's... And Europe has lost its fear of Russia. You, you, listen, you listen to the... Uh, NATO General Secretary, he talks to Russia like it was some sort of two-bit banana republic. You listen to the way the British talk about Russia, like, oh, you know, we're going to beat them up tomorrow. And you see just little countries now are arrogant toward Russia. Uh, this is not good. <laughs> uh, this never happened during the Cold War. There was never a time when the United States was arrogant toward Russia, toward the Soviet Union. Nobody would risk that. It was dangerous. 
you, we were trying to reduce tensions, not elevate them. But we've been elevating tensions now for years. You know, I'm, I'm a, I was part of the Cold War. I can say with full confidence that the tensions today are much higher than they ever were, even during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And during the Cold War in the United States, there were two sides. There was a debate how you best deal with the Soviet Union. Today, there's only one side. You impose hegemony on them. There's nobody saying other than me, Stephen Cohen died a few years ago, so there were two of us. Now there's one who says, wait a minute, this is dangerous. You're not going to win, neoconservatives. You're going to provoke a worst war, a, a bad war with nuclear weapons. You're going to provoke that. That's where this is headed. And I'm telling the same thing to the Kremlin. When you show acceptance of endless provocations, you're going to get more provocations and they're going to get worse. So I'm not on either side. I want to avoid the final provocation where everything goes boom. Because I don't think the Russians are going to surrender. I don't think the Chinese are either. And as long as the neoconservatives think they can push and push without any real consequence, they're going to push. And that's the situation. It's obvious. It's, I don't see why people have any trouble understanding it. It is so obvious. And, um, but it goes on. You think you think that what would be the solution to this war in Ukraine? You think negotiations or no. complete defeat of Ukraine? The, the solution is Russia has to close the place down. They they can do that simply with missiles. They can take out all the power generation. They can take out all the water systems. They can take out all the public transportation, all the railroads, the, ra the train stations, the roads. They could drop parach parachute troops to seal off uh, Western Ukraine from, the, from, from NATO and the U.S. The whole thing would be over with in a week. They go, go into Kiev, hang Zelensky as a war criminal, uh, put in a government, establish a government, ignore the West, ignore the UN, but get the job done, then nobody can interfere, nobody can intervene. We, we, when a country that has the potential of power uses it, the opposition isn't all that anxious to try to confront them directly with troops. It's just not, you know. And I can see very quickly the Germans would say, oh, what if the Russians hit Berlin? I can see the French say, oh, what if they hit Paris? Well, they, we can't stop it. We can't do anything about it. So let's not antagonize them. But instead, the Russians just show weakness and more weakness and more indecision. And yeah. How, how do you see the situation of NATO today? Because Finland just joined NATO. How do you see? Do you see them more united than before? Yes, they're more united, but not for the reasons they say. They're more united because they see Russia as a paper tiger. They don't fear Russia. If they feared Russia, they would say, I don't want to be in NATO. See, why did, you know, Finland has had no trouble with Russia since the Second World War. And it's worked being neutral. They've not suffered in any way from being neutral. Neither has Sweden. 
They have no reason to join NATO. They're not threatened. Nothing has gone wrong for them. They had good relations. So why did they join? Well, they were probably, the politicians were probably paid off by Washington to join. But they saw they had nothing to lose because Russia's it's not doing anything. We've had all these provocations and all these Russian red lines and the red lines get crossed again and again and again. Nothing happens. So there's no danger in opposing Russia. So we join NATO. We'll take the money. So what's the cost? What threat do we face from Russia? We don't face a threat. I mean, not even Kiev faces a threat. Not even Kiev faces a threat. You see, when you have a war, the first thing you do is take out the enemy's control centers. They didn't do that. The, the, <clears throat> the Kremlin has conducted this intervention in a way that leaves Kiev able to conduct the war. So the neocons say, well, look, it's, they're not serious. They're not serious. We are. Victoria Newland is serious. <laughs> Putin didn't. <laughs> well, this is a huge difference. I don't know why people can't understand this. I mean, maybe they just think, oh, the notion of America controlling the world is absurd. Well, but the trouble is the neoconservatives don't think it's absurd. <laughs> And nobody is doing anything to deprive them of that view. Everything the Kremlin does reinforces that view. <laughs> so that's the problem. It's very simple. That's a very simple it's a problem. Let's, let's go to the last question. I wanted to know if NATO is so stronger, is it more united, why Germany is incapable of, of, of talking about the sabotage of Nord Stream Pipeline? Why, did, why a country like Germany, that is big, as big as Germany, as considering the, the, their economy, considering their, their power in Europe, but they're saying they're, they're silent as stone. You don't understand there's no power in Europe. Germany is not an independent country, it's still occupied by the Americans. Germany is a puppet state like France, like Great Britain, like Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands. These are not real governments. These are puppet states of Washington. They would never go against Washington. It would be the end of them. All, everything, all the money would be cut off, sanctions, trade. <laughs> NATO, NATO itself is not strong in the sense of being strong from America. NATO is an American operation. NATO is one of the ways the United States has made Europe into a, an empire. For the U.S., they don't. It, it it's how Washington makes their foreign policy decisions for them. How it makes their security decisions for them. The the notion that Germany is going to come up and stand up to Washington is that's implausible. I see. I mean, you look, the, the Americans have brainwashed the Germans ever since 1945. We control their education. We've told them they're all a bunch of Nazi holocausters and they're, they're full of evil. They've done terrible things to the world. And that's what's taught in the school. A German grows up thinking he's a world-class criminal. That was our intent. You, if you're a German historian, you can't challenge anything about World War II. 
You can't say anything about the Holocaust. You can't say anything. You have to just go with whatever the narrative is that we put in the school books. There's no independence in Europe. They don't even have independent intelligence services. I see. So, and if it, that should be obvious. When does Europe? When does Europe ever voted against an American position in the UN? When did did NATO say, uh, "Oh, we're not going to go to Ukraine's help"? No. <laughs> Everything's pouring in there. See, and it's not just Western Europe because the Americans put into the American Empire what was the former Soviet. Empire, Eastern Europe, and even constituent parts of the former Soviet Union itself, and f parts of former Russia are now in the American Empire. Poland, Georgia, I mean everything but Serbia. <laughs> I see. Romania. All of them. It's so. I think that uh, there's a lack of realism, and uh, it's uh, leading the world to nuclear war. Is it going to remain like this? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Because Macron. If you if you know Macron went to China, he said France is not is not the American vassal state. I don't know. Yeah, but it is. <laughs> it is. It doesn't change the reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, what it doesn't matter what anybody in Europe says. And they don't they don't go against Washington. Look what's happened to France. It was a few years ago where we we forced the French to cancel contracts they had with Russia, building some kind of ships. We forced them to cancel them, and it, even though we put huge numbers of French workmen out of jobs. And the French had to pay huge sums of money, billions of dollars, and uh, to the Russians for violating the contracts. Uh, right after that, we we uh, brought charges against uh, the big French bank, and we forced them uh, to give almost all their capital to us. Well, we were going to do terrible. Well, the French government never did anything but go along with Washington. It let us destroy its shipbuilding industry. It let us literally destroy its biggest bank. I mean, what do they do? They, they do nothing. There were years, years ago, I had an opportunity to ask the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs in Washington, in his office, I said, how is it the United States always gets Europe to do what we want? Money, he said. I said, oh, you mean foreign aid? No. We give the leaders bagfuls of money. We own them. They report to us. That's the story. He didn't make it up. <laughs> he actually didn't approve of it, but he couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> and yeah. and it's so important because it doesn't matter, Paul. It doesn't matter if you live in Iran, in Middle East, in Brazil. When it comes to nuclear power, n nuclear bombing, it's it's yeah. everything is gonna be gone. Nothing gonna survive on this planet. That's right. 
That's right. That's that's why I speak out. And of course, they say I'm a Russian agent because I don't I don't uh, support the official narrative. So it's uh, hard to speak out. And if you're in a university here, you can't. They they would dismiss you. So. This is another huge difference from the Cold War, because during the Cold War, there was a lot of debate and argument. Well, today, they don't permit it. I don't even know, I don't know that the, why they permit me. I don't think they will much longer. But it's... Um, it's so sad to see we are going in this direction right now. Well... I think the United States has been going in this direction ever since the Soviet collapse. In fact, in many ways, it was already in that uh, in that direction. You know, it was uh, President John Kennedy in the early '60s was presented with a plan by the American Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, to attack uh, the Soviet Union with hydrogen bombs in order to get rid of them before the Russians and the Soviets had uh, similar capabilities. Uh, Kennedy told them that they were crazy, and no. <laughs> but you see, it's always been sort of uh, U.S. dominates, we dominate, we dominate. Uh, we've had an empire for a long time, you know, we we took Cuba and the Philippines away from the Spanish, you know. Uh, of course, uh, the North uh, destroyed the Confederacy. We don't, it's, uh, you know, we, we stole uh, the Southwest and California from Mexico. <laughs> It's, it's just, uh, it's always been an empire, a growing empire. And uh, Roosevelt used World War II to dethrone England, to take the reserve currency role away from the pound, and put it to the dollar. We forced an end to uh, the British control of, of trade. We forced the British to give up their empire. Uh, and then we began taking it over, <laughs> including them. <laughs> so uh, we pretend that we're a democracy, but uh, we, but you can't have a fair election. <laughs>